Meet us, O Christ, in this stillness of morning. Move us, O Spirit, to quiet our hearts. And mend us, O Father, from yesterday's harms. From the discords of yesterday, resurrect our peace. From the discouragements of yesterday, resurrect our hope. From the weariness of yesterday, resurrect our strength. From the doubts of yesterday, resurrect our faith. And from the wounds of yesterday, resurrect our love. Let us enter this new day aware of our need and awake to your grace, O Lord. Amen. fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out yes I will lift you high in the valley yes i will bless your name yes i will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days yes i will on one thing the same God that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out and yet Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy for all my days. Yes, I like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy 
when all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me and oh how he loves us so Oh, how He loves us, how He loves us so. And He is jealous for me, loves like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory, and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. And oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us so. How he loves. Yeah, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves. And we are his portion and he is our prize. Drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes. If grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. So heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss, and my heart turns violently inside of my chest. I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way, oh, how he loves us so, oh, how he loves us, how he loves us so, how he loves, yeah, he us so Will you please stand as we read our key text for today? I will be reading from John 1, 1 through 18 in the New American Standard Bible 2020 update. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, not even one thing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not grasp it. A man came, one sent from God, and his name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. 
This was the true light that coming from the, from the world enlightens every person. He was in the world and the world came into being through him. And yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not accept him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of a man, but of God. And the word becomes flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as the Son, only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and calling out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who is coming after me has proved to be my superior, because he existed before me. For of his fulfillness we have all received, and grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. God, the only Son, who is in the arms of the Father, he has explained him. You may be seated. So, as you, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I have a table because I need a table for my coffee. Uh, but this morning, uh, as we get started, uh, the Christian Bible, as you know, is separated into two testaments. Maybe you don't know this. I think sometimes we just assume everyone in church knows everything, but just in case you don't. The Bible is, as we know, it is separated into two testaments. We have what is commonly known as the Old Testament, maybe the Hebrew or Jewish Bible, and uh, that is uh, the, the first part of the Bible, right? This is the text that Jesus would have read as a child. This is the text that's been around inside the Jewish tradition for years. Inside, uh, we have on the second side, we have the New Testament or Christian Testament. Now, this contains the gospels, the epistles. This is the story of Jesus, the story of the early church. And then, um, as one theologian put it, it's a theological knife fight because basically all of these letters come because they're trying to solve a problem that has emerged in the church. Because imagine that, people in church are arguing in the first century. And so that was a joke because, no, okay. Um, and so, as we start the New Testament, the New Testament starts with four letters. And what's important is that the entire New Testament, they're all letters. They are written to a particular people at a particular place at a particular time for a particular reason. Uh, which does not mean that they don't matter to us. Actually, they matter a whole lot to us. But they all start off as letters, including these four gospels. And gospel means good news. It's a brand new genre of literature as well that's created by the early church. Now the Gospels are all attributed to um, either one of the apostles, which means someone who walked or saw Jesus, or one of their disciples, direct disciples. Um, and just a little fascinating side note. As we look at the development of the early church, uh, and uh, if, you, if you look at the work cited page, there's some podcasts about this, but uh, not every church would have had all four Gospels. You sit at a very unique place in history, where that you have the entirety of the Bible in front of you, you have the ability to listen to it or read it um, in its entirety. Also, you're very weird in that you're illiterate. We were just talking to my son about this recently, that uh, this is the first time in human history that most people in a culture can read. And so for the majority of human history, it's been read to people. Um, but anyway, in the early church, there would have been communities that may have only had like the Gospel of Mark or just the Gospel of John which is fascinating because if you have just the Gospel of Mark, Mary's only mentioned twice and that whole virgin birth thing doesn't show up. He starts off almost immediately in ministry. And so this is an interesting thing that happens in the development of the church. It really has not a whole lot to do with everything we're talking about this morning, but it's a thing that I love to nerd out about um, as we just think about how we got to where we're at. Um, so the first three of these Gospels are called the Synoptics. Um, and what they do is they basically are a what-focused retelling of the stories of Jesus. We're pretty sure the earliest one is the Gospel of Mark, written around 50 CE or AD, whatever your preferred timing uh, designation is, but about around the year 50. It would have come after probably the writing of 1 Thessalonians, because Paul's the one who kicks off this idea of writing letters. Um, Mark is written primarily to Gentiles, meaning people who weren't Jews by religion or birth. 
It's pretty action-packed, it's pretty fast. Uh, it's the shortest of them, and that's part of the reason we think it's the earliest one. And it's followed by Matthew and Luke because we just assume that like the first draft is always the shortest, so we just keep adding things and expanding. And so Matthew's written to a Jewish audience. Uh, the whole point of the Gospel of Matthew is to say that Jesus is a better Abraham, he's a better Moses, he's a better David. Our Messiah is the one who was promised, and it is Jesus. And so he's writing to a Jewish audience, and so he leans really really into these things, which is why in the, uh, the book of Matthew, you have this really extended genealogy, which most of us skip over, right? Um, but that would have been really important to a Jewish audience. Uh, the Gospel of Luke is a history that's linked also with the, uh, the book of Acts. Um, and it's possibly written in part as a legal defense of Paul, who's in Rome as a Roman citizen, uh, just basically saying that the, the Christian faith isn't new and novel, that it is in fact connected to this ancient deep faith. Luke, uh, of course, didn't follow Jesus around as an apostle, but he was a disciple of an apostle. And then we get to John's gospel, which is the last one both chronologically and the order of the Gospels as we look in uh, the New Testament. And what's fascinating about John is that it is, um, as commentators will gently put it, the simplest of the Gospels in its writing, the most unsophisticated in its Greek. They don't quite call John stupid, uh, but they come real close, right? Um, it's written last, probably in the 90s, and... Uh, it's written for a very different purpose than the other ones. John is most likely written to people who already are Jesus followers, people who are already disciples of the way. And he's writing basically to interact with some things called Gnosticism and whatnot. This entire first chapter of John could be a 12-week series uh, because it's also important because we're living so much of it out now. And so John's gospel is very visceral. It's very, there's touching and it's physical and there's it's less emphasis on exorcisms and miracles and more on Jesus's divinity which gets me to my favorite Christmas story which is a thing that if you've been around me for a while you've probably heard. And it's what we just read. And in this fascinating start of John's gospel, we've got something for Jewish audiences and something for Greek audiences and Hellenized audiences. And it's in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and he was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him and apart from him, not even one thing came into being that has come into being. So in the beginning references what, anyone? Yeah, there we go, Genesis, yes, this, thank you. And it's, uh, it's the start to the first creation narrative in, in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. So if you're a Jewish reader reading this, this idea of it being connected to that, what John is starting off with his very first words is the thing that we're about to talk about is connected to the very primordial story that we have carried as a people for millennia. It's connected to our eternity in the mind of the reader because of this. And this is something that has always been, because in Genesis 1, it's less of, a, in the beginning is less of a starting point. Uh, if you want to play uh, pretty strictly with the Hebrew, it's actually more of a Star Wars long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away sort of situation. And John is connecting that this word, this, this logos in the Greek, in the New Testament, and as he's re we're reading there, um, it has some meanings for the Jews because the word of Yahweh ha has always been foundational. Yahweh, of course, being the name of God that he reveals to Moses, but Yahweh, his spoken word means so much. He speaks into existence all of creation in that first creation narrative. It's powerful. Let it be, and it was, and it was good. Uh, in fact, uh, Oftentimes when we have these instances where people ask to see or see God, they don't actually see anything. What we, we've got like, so when Moses asked to see the glory of Yahweh in Exodus, right? The sight isn't, what's described isn't something that's eyeballed or something that he visually perceives. What we get is Yahweh declaring in Exodus 34, Yahweh is compassionate, Yahweh, uh, sorry, Yahweh, Yahweh is compassionate and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in love and kindness and truth, who keeps faithfulness for thousands, who forgives wrongdoing of the violation of his law and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, inflicting the punishment of fathers on the children, on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. That passage, and again, is one of those like three or four week passages because it's the only time we have in the text where God stops to self-describe. 
This is the voice of Yahweh saying who I am, and as he leads, talks about being compassionate. And this is when Moses sees the glory of the Lord, he hears Yahweh declaring who he is. Uh, we see this again in Isaiah 6, when Isaiah is commissioned in the prophetic books, uh, who, uh, whom shall I send who will go before us? And what we've got here is there's lots of descriptions around Yahweh, but at no point in all of the things that are happening in that short little section of scripture does Isaiah actually ever describe Yahweh. What actually the entire interaction leans on is the spoken word of the deity. And that is the revelation of, of, of seeing him. The word of God is the primary revelation that we see there. And so this idea of the word being so powerful and important is clutch as we look in Jewish theology. It's also this, this idea of logos is really important in uh, Greek philosophy, which seems like why are we talking about that? But it's really important because it's important to the audience of John at this moment. Big picture, the Greeks had this kind of dualistic view that there is this like good stuff, the ether, the divine, it's, uh, it's We'll call it the ether for now. It's just everything good and spiritual. It's awesome. It's great. It's lovely. It's perfect. It's immutable. It's amazing. And then there's this. Anything physical, the stuff that's made up of elements and atoms and protons and neutrons, electrons, quarks, mesons and Higgs bosons, like the stuff that we, you and I are made of is inherently dirty and filthy and evil and awful, often awful and corrupted. It is worthless which may sound familiar to you as you kind of think through maybe how the things of creation have been talked about previously in your world. But in between this and the this is this membrane called the logos. Because the, 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 the ether, the good stuff, can't interact with this. And so as John writes, in the beginning was the logos, the word. Both audiences are familiar in some way with this concept. But the idea that John then immediately leans into is that the Logos is both of the same essence or stuff as Yahweh, but distinct from the internal deity as well, yet is the deity. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is a complex thing that we have been talking about for about 2,023 years. As John's original audiences would have read this, it was probably a little bit offensive. It was very weird and very hard to understand. Uh, we know that because it's hard for us to understand. This idea that the word that he's describing is both of God and is God and is showing up is difficult, but it's important because of what John describes about the word coming here. He, the word, was in the world and the world came into being through him and yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not accept him. So quick pause here. Again, as we look back at that Jewish testament, throughout the prophetic books especially, the common refrain of Yahweh is that I will be your God and you will be my people. This idea that he came to his own is that he wanted to come to his people, his people being not just the Jews, but the entirety of the world. Um, through lots of reasons, that didn't happen. But it's this idea of a return to the garden state, and the you is a global. But continuing further in the text, and the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we saw his glory, the glory as the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. This is what's called, in fancy theological words, the incarnation. Quite literally, it is the in-meetness of God that the creator of the universe, the one who everything was created through, the agent of creation as we see the spirit hovering over the waters of chaos in Genesis, and the one who has been, everything has been made through, puts on skin and bone and muscles and hair and is born to a teenage girl in the backwater of the Roman Empire. This is the story that John is talking about. And this is actually undergirds the thrust 
of his gospel is that is this in meekness is that he puts on this physical matter and this, um, even as John's describing it, it has this, these echoes of back in Exodus when, when Yahweh self-reveals and says, uh, he says that, when Yahweh reveals, he says, I'm compassionate and merciful. I'm slow to anger, abounding in faithfulness and truth. I keep faithfulness for thousands, forgive wrongdoing and the violations of law and sin. The term there for um, faithfulness, um, abounding faithfulness, is hesed. And hesed is the New Testament, the New Testament is translated as grace. It is undeserved, loving, kindness, goodness, and mercy. Uh, Yahweh can do it to humanity, humanity can do it to humanity, but humanity can never give hesed to Yahweh because he is the des deserver of everything because he's the creator of everything. And so in the New Testament, as John is writing his gospel to these Christians who are struggling and who are wondering, was this Jesus a physical being? Was he just a spiritual apparition? And all these sorts of things. John says he puts on skin and meat and he comes and he dwells among us, coming in grace and in truth. And he also uses this term to dwell, amongst, dwell among us. And what that is, that term in the Old Testament is to tabernacle with us. If you uh, have read through the, the Old Testament, you'll know that there is this thing called the tabernacle, kind of walked around uh, the Ark of the Covenant, if you've ever, uh, it was there. Um, if you think about the uh, Indiana Jones, if you're from the 80s. Um, but this was this reminder, it was an echo of an echo of what the throne room of, of Yahweh looked like here on earth. But now instead of an echo of an echo, what we have is the very real presence, the creating essence here among us. Temporarily, just like the ta tabernacle but here amongst us. And as we think through this idea, it should shape us as disciples because that's what John is going to push through in the entirety of his gospel is what do we do with the divinity of Jesus? Why does this matter for us in our day to day? All this stuff that maybe none of us care about so far, why does it matter? And it matters because if we are disciples, we are supposed to take on the yoke of our rabbi or the teaching of our rabbi. We live it out, we share it, and we moves us forward. And so John will spend the rest of his gospel writing about why this in meekness, this incarnation matters so much and why it matters so much that the incarnation came in grace and truth. Not truth and grace, but grace and truth. In the ancient Near East, especially in uh, this region of the world, what was more important or what there was more of or more like weight to comes first. And what comes first is grace and truth. There is no truth without grace and there's no grace without truth, but grace is the thing that leads. And as Jesus, um, and we think about Jesus in this, uh, as he's living out, not just this in meekness and coming down here, we think about who we see Jesus spending time with. Uh, Jesus' first miracle is that a, a wedding feast that's being celebrated, um, and the insight to that miracle isn't given to the person who is wealthy and throwing the wedding, it's to the servants who saw the miracle happen when Jesus turns the water into wine. He spends time with Samaritans, and the, it's hard to get 100% analog for the Samaritans in the 21st century. Uh, there's a couple different categories. They're biracial, um, half Greek, half Jewish. They're the, the remnants of what happens when the, the Greeks invaded uh, you know, a couple generations ago, because in all of ancient history, the way that you pacify a population is you breed them out of existence. And the Samaritans are the leftovers of that, and they have this weird half Jewish, half not Jewish faith, and basically everybody hates them. That shows up a lot in the New Testament and in the ancient Near World. Um, Jesus spends a lot of time with women and children. And we've talked about this before here that they aren't really highly thought of. They're kind of worthless. Not my view, but that is the view of culture at the time. We start to look at the other gospels. Uh, he eats with the sinner, the outcast, the people who aren't good enough. Uh, his collection of mostly adolescent disciples, the core, the 12, uh, include, uh, you know, a thing that I say a lot, probably, is a guy who's probably a freedom fighter or an insurrectionist, depending on what side of Roman history you're on. Uh, he's got 
two brothers who are always ready to, to fight. At one point, the sons of thunder are miffed because they were not invited into a village and they ask God to call down fire. They, they basically ask for an airstrike on women and children in a village because they were upset that they'd been offended. Uh, Jesus, by the way, does not do that and, and backs them down. Um, we have a collaborator, a traitor in the tax collector. Uh, and there's a guy that, to this day, we still call Doubting Thomas because he asked reasonable questions. Jesus wasn't with the elites or the smartest or the wealthiest most of the time. And part of that is, is because the politically connected tried to kill him as a baby, um, and then they would also later murder him uh, on a cross. Uh, the most educated did not like him at all either. The Pharisees, as we see them, uh, loved their theology way more than they loved the one that they were theologizing about. The wealthiest were uh, not wanting their prosperity interrupted, so we see that in the Sadducees, who were the wealthy kind of leading class there. And so we gotta ask for ourselves, when we look at who Jesus is hanging out with, the stories that he tells, what does it mean for us as disciples? And I think what that means for us is that we also go to places of hurt and harm to love those that no one else will. We never did anything to earn the grace and even the truth of God. Like this, is, this is essential to our fundamental beliefs as, as a church and in ch Christian history is that we have never earned this. Everything that we have is because of his goodness. We are the benefactors of his grace. And so when he moves towards us, which is this consistent thing. He moves towards Adam and Eve in the garden after the sin incident, and that question of where are you, I don't think is a question of like, I don't know where people are at in my kingdom. It's, a, it's an invitation to come home. Uh, again, he moves towards uh, humanity in covenant relationship. He, uh, through the prophets, every time it is, it is Yahweh making the first move towards us, even though we are fighting and screaming and kicking and swearing and cursing him. And so he moves towards us in love, and we, uh, a lot of us this morning, say we're Christians, that we follow this Jesus. And I think that if we're gonna be Christians, if we're gonna follow this Jesus, we have to do what Jesus did and what he tells us to do, because that is the best example of who God is. It is the word made flesh who comes in grace and truth. I believe that Christians go to places of hurt and harm to open-ended stories where we don't know the end and the outcome. And this is what underlies my basic theology of life, but also my, th my theology of chaplaincy, which is the thing I'm supposed to be talking about this morning. And you're like, oh, finally we're getting there. Um, so John asked me to talk about chaplaincy, and we're gonna, uh, we'll talk about it more downstairs um, in, the, in the venue. I'll ask, answer some specific questions in a Q&A, because uh, children are here. Um, but overview of what I do. Uh, so I've got, I, f I help, Basically, in my role as a law enforcement chaplain, I work with the police officers. Um, and if you grab the handout on the way in, you'll see that they have a 21-year shorter life expectancy than everybody else in the general population. That's from a Buffalo study done out of Buffalo, New York, uh, I want to say in the 80s. Um, they have a higher suicide rate uh, than the rest of the background population. Have a heart attack. Uh, average age of a first-time heart attack for an law enforcement officer is the age of 40. Um, for the general population, the first-time heart attack usually doesn't happen until 60. Um, they have a really stressful job, and we forget oftentimes in society what we ask them to see and hear and smell and remember on our behalf so that we don't have to, right? So my role, officer facing, is to ask, do you want a snack? Do you want a cup of coffee? Do you want to talk about your feelings? Um, the first two are to trick them into the third thing. Uh, uh, I do a lot with officer wellness and that sort of thing. Uh, I interact with a lot of families in crisis. One of the things I do is I tell people that their loved one died. Um, and uh, I do a lot of that. Uh, sometimes uh, going to homes and telling people that like, hey, your kid was in a pretty terrible car accident. We don't know if they're gonna live and you need to be at the hospital. Uh, I sit with kids as DCS is removing them from homes. This is what I do in my role, right? I also do some community-facing things, so I interact with our homeless population, and uh, if you ever want to know, like, what's a thing that I can do to help in Columbus? I generally probably have five or six projects, because I just know where hurting is happening. 
Uh, I also do some things with schools and whatnot. Uh, if you ever want to know why your teenager shouldn't have a cell phone or your kid shouldn't have a cell phone, I will tell you stories about what my detectives are dealing with this week alone. Um, I really won't because I can't, but I will tell you that it's all awful and your kid is good, but um, also the world is not always great. So this is what I do. Um, and uh, I do this because I have a fundamental belief, uh, or at least theologically why I do this, is because I have this fundamental belief that we move towards where there is brokenness and hurt. So I move towards my officers because their divorce rate's incredibly high. They are carrying, again, the scars of the world and the things that we ask them to see on our behalf. And my role there is not, I'm not their pastor, um, but helping them towards wellness. And in that, do I get to have really great conversations about Jesus? All the time. Um, I sit with families in crisis and help them navigate what's next. Because oftentimes what we need is just someone to give us the practical next step. Um, I connect a lot of people with things that they can do in the community, and I try to help keep kids safe. So this is part of what I do as a chaplain. We've got some other chaplains, both at the city and the county. Um, and you can join in on this if you want. This is, yeah, this is the next slide. Um, so the link are the hands out on the screen. And I'll be honest, what I really need right now is I need snacks for my officers. We've got an Amazon list. We've got a wellness station that we've got. And uh, we're, we're short on snacks. Right now the pantries are bare. This has been a huge morale boost. The, the guys and gals love it. Uh, there's something about like, hey, people in my community bought me a cup of coffee. They bought me, you know, um, pistachios, which they are pistachio crazy. Um, <laughs> they just really, like, these are the things that they, that it means so much. Um, when at two in the morning, everything's closed, oh, there's a place that has been provided by people in my town who love me enough to take care of me. Um, that's what I need right now. Um, but there's more information there, and we can talk more about it later. Um, I also take Sam's Club, Walmart, and Target gift cards for that as well. All this, right, though, comes out of, as Christians, we are called to move towards brokenness as ambassadors. Ambassadors are not responsible for the outcomes of the message. Ambassadors are not responsible for creating the message. Ambassadors, as a role, make a representation to people as they've been sent by the government. So when our ambassador goes and speaks to you know, the government of Lithuania, the ambassador is not making decisions. It's uh, on behalf of us as a people and really the executive and uh, legislative branch mostly. And so we as ambassadors of Christ are responsible for carrying the message. We don't know the outcome. Not every story is rosy and happy and pretty and a nice, neat bow. Um, but we carry the message everywhere we go. We find places to go. We don't get to have uh, this feeling of, I don't like those people uh, because of, you know, who they love or what, or like what their profession is or where, you know, how they vote. We don't get to have that. Ours is not to do that. Ours is to come in grace and truth. Again, we tell the truth and we show up with it, but we show up first in grace. No one cares how much you know until they know that you care about them. That is a almost universal thing. And so we join him, we join Jesus in what one commentator called a statistic, statistical failure of a mission. Because fewer people will come to Jesus because of our action than that won't, right? And we see this even in Jesus' own ministry. <laughs> we join him in that, not because we are good or because we want to feel good or because we're great. We do it because he did it. And he continually moves towards and to this day bears the scars of what it took for us to be rescued and freed and loved. And so Christians, I don't think we get out of this world unscathed because I don't think we're called to be safe. I think we're called to be next to the king as he's liberating the world from darkness. And that does not come without being harmed but we do it because we are with the king in that. We join into these open-ended stories directly because this is what our rabbi did. So this morning, uh, I think the call for all of us is to figure out those places and ways that we can join in and we can move towards places where we show up in rescue and in hope.
I think uh, this morning, also coming, coming out of all of this, is uh, some of us have never really interacted with the text, right? We've never read the entirety of the Bible. And I know it seems like a weird thing to pull from like, the word comes here, but the word is so powerful and so important that this is what stands. Now here, some of you may be like, John, I hate to read. That's fine. Just so you know, again, most of human history, most of church history, people have not actually read the Bible themselves. It has been read to them by the one person who could read. And so, you live in the 21st century, the internet machine exists, there are all sorts of places to get audible, audio versions of the Bible completely for free. It's on Spotify, it's on the YouTube. Uh, I'm sure if you Googled it, you can find a bunch of other places. Uh, version, and all sorts of versions. If we're supposed to carry a story, we should know that story. I think also it's an invitation that if we've been living as less than human, if we've been living outside in darkness to be invited into light, to become this adopted son or daughter that John writes about at the beginning of his gospel, that we become part of the family of God, not exactly the same as the son, but in the same family because he came and dwelt amongst us. He in meted with us. So this morning, we believe that God is good. That when he looked at the world that he created, he said it was good. Guilt enters the picture because sin that separates us from, from God, that makes us less than human, enters the picture. But God in his grace and goodness did not leave us alone. So by his grace, Jesus, who put on skin and bones and meat and flesh, died on a Roman cross, but three days later resurrected making it possible for us to come home from exile, to be forgiven of our sins, to be welcomed home, and to be put on mission alongside him as he's rescuing the world. And we live lives of gratitude where we move into places of darkness taking light because of his action. So if you've never said yes to that, Jesus, this morning, you're absolutely invited into that. And if this idea of supporting law enforcement, or you got some questions about it, and, and the work that myself and other chaplains are doing makes your heart sing and it seems interesting to you, uh, you can join in there. Um, it feels weird to come up here and pitch a thing to you like that, but uh, there you go, it's pitched. Um, like I said, we'll talk about it some more next door if you wanna come over and uh, ask some questions about that or criticize the, the theological points made in the sermon, you can do that too, that would be fun. Um, so, uh, but with that said, let me pray for us. Father, we continue to believe that you are good, gracious, and kind. Uh, we think that because you told us so when you said, this is who I am. We also know this because when you uh, showed up in Jesus, you came in grace and in truth. You came towards us in a time that we didn't earn and hadn't been good enough knowing the things that we had already done and the things that we don't know that we will do, you have seen those and still said that you would move towards us. So Father, what we pray is that as we leave this place today, that we'd be people of that resurrection, people of hope, people that in meet your grace and your kindness and your love and your truth in all the places that we find ourselves. We pray for forgiveness in those places where we've hardened our hearts and said, but at least I'm not them. We ask that you would uh, break open our hearts and break open relationships so that we can be incarnate with people that maybe we have rejected for so long. We thank you that we're invited, not only to be forgiven, but also to work with you as you're rescuing the world. We pray that we'd be a place that uh, for the next 200 years would be a place that is rescuing the world alongside you. And it's in the name of our Rabbi Yeshua, who tabernacled amongst us, who was the Logos made flesh. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Will you stand as we sing? you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing 
of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire. In darkest night, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful, all my life you have been so, so With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Good morning. All right. So, um, first of all, for those who came to uh, our play this week, I hope you can still take me seriously, even though you've now seen me in a dress. Um, if you are not able to do so, give me some kind of signal, and I will just sh soft shoe right out of the room this way. So, are we good? Everybody good? Good. Okay. Wonderful. 
Um, so the main part of my message this morning comes from a website called The Christian Standard. This piece was written by Doug Redford and it's titled Take Communion and Take Heart. Um, it's actually kind of a mix of his words and mine to the point where if I turn this in as a high school paper, they would fail me for plagiarizing. Um, so please forgive me if that's a sin. Uh, Jesus told us, in this world you will have trouble. That seems rather obvious. Anyone could draw that conclusion. It's what Jesus said before and after that statement that makes it so noteworthy. Before it, Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. And after it, he said, but take heart, I have overcome the world. On the night Jesus made this statement, a special kind of trouble awaited him. He knew exactly what it was. It was his arrest and eventual death. On the same night, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper with his disciples. In just a few hours, it would look as if Jesus had been overcome and that his enemies had succeeded in silencing his voice. But three days later, that voice and influence returned in resurrected power. Um, how many of you came to the Columbus Collective concert that was here this last summer? Was it, do we have a good audience for that? Um, so Anna Kruger is one of the members of the band, and um, she, she actually played the piano on stage right. I know that because I'm a thespian now. This is stage right. Um, uh, in, the, in the chorus of the song she sings, um, excuse me, the song is called Even Still, and it's one that she wrote herself. Um, it makes me emotional every time I listen to it. It's a great song. If you haven't, it is on YouTube. Uh, but in the chorus she sings, even if you won't move this mountain, still I know you're good. And if you won't take this pain, even still, I'll praise your name. Ask yourself, how many times has the world gotten so dark that we have forgotten that even still God is good? That answer can vary for each of us, I'm sure, but I know personally I can th think of at least five times right now in my life that I've forgotten that. Um, Jesus contrasted that life in this world where there is trouble with life in me where there is peace. Communion offers us this opportunity to remember that while we live, that while we must live in this troubled world, we have also chosen to live in Jesus, in the kingdom, which is not in this world. As we take communion together today, let us also, as Jesus said, take heart. The overcomer has made each of us overcomers. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. 